two push-ups. And uh, functional fitness. Functional, functional fitness. fitness. Got to keep it going. <laughs> Right. Well, is that time? I want to say thank you all so much for being here today, not only at the Wild Center, but to join us for this presentation with Dr. James Peruk. My name is Leanne. I'm one of our staff members in the education department here. And I want to share with you not only about this presentation that we're going to get a wonderful experience today, but about our science speaker series that we have going on this summer. So today is the third of our science speaker series presentations. Right now, you already made it. Congratulations. And our next one, the closing event that we have this summer, is on August 12th. Saturday, August 12th, we have author Layla Phillip, who will be here to present on her book, Beaverlands, How One Weird Rodent Made America. So if these types of conversations are engaging and exciting to you, I please encourage you to come back and join us in a few weeks to learn more about beavers. But today is all about another aquatic species that we know and love, the common loon, the sound that haunts us by the forests and by the waters all summer long that is not only nostalgic, but to me, very heartwarming and centering sound to hear. So we're going to learn more from Dr. James Brook. He's one of the foremost scientists and researchers of common loons in North America. Over 30 years of wonderful experience chasing these birds all across the country, learning about their migration, their winter breeding, and has a lot of wonderful stories and data to share with us today. Uh, with him, he also has our book, his book for sale in the book. Wow, book for sale in the store today called Loon Lessons, The Uncommon Encounters with the Great Northern Diver. So I encourage checking that out. There will be a book signing to follow this presentation right outside the theater in the store. So come check out the book. Get yourself a signed copy today while you are here. Without further ado, because you're here not to talk to me, but to talk with our lovely presenter, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Peruk to share more about his experiences, uh, and then we'll have time at the end for a facilitated Q&A. So keep all those questions in your brain, and we'll be able to answer those towards the end of the program. So let's get this all turned over for you. Thank you, and please, round of applause <laughs> while we're getting things ready here. That's what we like to see. There we are. And you have Dr. Peruk. All right, thank you, Leanne. Uh, let's see if the speaker, can you hear me well enough? So far, thumbs up's good. So she said something, got something incorrect. This talk is actually Ooh. two hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> because we love loons, we can stay here and talk all day. So, but maybe she's gonna like reel, reel me in. I might try. We'll try see. to keep me down. So, uh, so I'm really excited to hear it's a beautiful day. We all love loons, and I've been fortunate to kind of make it my career of studying loons. feel very blessed. I've kind of given over 125 loon talks in the last two years. I've been traveling around the country just giving loon talks. I just came back from being in Minnesota. This is New York? <laughs> New York, yes, of course. No, I'm just sorry about that, no. Uh, and it's just great to be here. And so I'm going to share with you the, some trails and information that we've learned about loons over the last 30 years. And then we'll have some time for questions for you. So I'm a professor at St. Joe's College. I've moved around a little bit over my career doing this. And hey, Leanne, I'm doing my dance. Hold on. We got this. It is this one. You, oh, you're definitely hitting the right button. It's the on button. That would help. That would yeah. Hey, Leanne, let's try this again. Take two. All right, take two. Here we go. So the talk's going to be in threes. I think threes is, works pretty well. Like my approach as a scientist to learning about loons, then the latest and greatest findings we've discovered about loons over the last 30 years, and the third part would be stories from the field. And we can almost go to stories from the field, which is really lots of fun, but we're going to save, this, save that for the end. So this is my career. I started working with loons in 1993 full time. I hadn't shaved in seven years. I'm not really sure who that individual was, but that was me. At some point in time, this is releasing a loon. And then I had a chance to work on the north slope of Alaska. So just seeing you in the bottom left-hand corner here, this is looking at, for example, yellow-billed loons. And then this is me working at the Smithsonian Museum. So as I've gotten older, I've gotten now into the museums, which is apropos. So 
Because I'm unfamiliar to literally everybody here, except my wife, who might be here, and she might, has heard this talk, so she might not even be here. She accompanied me. But these are field seasons I've spent working. So field season might be a minimum of two weeks, but oftentimes it might be three or four months. So if I spent the summer studying them or the winter studying loons, so I take you up to Alaska. I was in Alaska for two field seasons, Saskatchewan for three field seasons, Washington State for four, two field seasons in Nevada. Like, what are you doing in Nevada? Well, I was gambling, right? No, it, loons migrate through Nevada, and it's a great place to study the migration of loons there. And then this is Southern California. This is me trying to get into Hollywood. I was rejected. That's OK. I'm all right with it. But there's loons that winter off Southern California, which is really fascinating. So two winters there. Seven winters off the coast of Louisiana. How cool is that to be there? Seven winters, actually this is a res freshwater reservoir in South Carolina. And I'm doing some research there. There's 150 loons on this large reservoir. And they're there all winter long. So it's a great spot. Six in New England. Most of that is winter work. And then 12 in the Midwest. So I spent three field seasons in Michigan, three in Wisconsin, and six in Minnesota. So that is my career over the last 30 years where I've worked and projects I've worked on. So we're all here not because of me, we're here because of the common loon, right? The Latin name is Gavia immer. In Europe, it's known as the great northern diver. And loons are different from ducks and geese and swans because they have a bunch of anatomical traits unique to them, which I won't go through all of them. And then there's a bunch of ecological traits as well, such as breeding in freshwater lakes and wintering in marine environments for the most part. So that's what makes essentially a loon a loon. And there's four other species of loons, all found in North America. So the one in the top left there is the red-throated loon. And the bottom left is the Pacific loon. The bottom right is the Arctic loon. The only difference here is this little white sticks out, which makes it, and it's slightly larger than the Pacific loon. And then the yellow-billed loon that we see up there. And the common loon is more closely related to the yellow-billed loon that we see there. So here's the loon trying to turn its eggs. And where does the name loon come from? Well, depending on sources, we do know it probably came from Europe, from Scandinavian nations or Swedish, where the word loon or loon means clumsy. And so it's a derivation of that. And because we know the feet are so far back on a loon, it can't walk on land, support itself upright. So they appear clumsy, and that's where we feel the name comes from. So 94% of all the loons breed in Canada. So 94% of all the loons breed in Canada, and the other 6% are in the United States. 2% is in Alaska, so only 4% are in the lower 48 states. So literally, you can see this. If, if the loons in Canada are doing well, then overall they're doing fairly well. So this is just the lower 48 states. We see a little bit in Washington, Montana, a little bit in North Dakota and the Turtle Mountains, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, upstate New York, and then Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. And they do breed a little bit in Greenland, as, especially as the ice is melting. Loons are showing up there, by the way. And then this is around Iceland. So the loons in New York and the Adirondacks and the interior of the continent right, almost always migrate to the oceans. And so this is their migratory pathways that we see. And in the winter, loons molt. So kind of late summer, early fall, loons begin to molt. And this is the plumage that they acquire. So it's very drab. And oftentimes, they're overlooked because they don't have the brilliant black and white breeding plumage that we so much associate with loons that we see here. And then they will molt into that breeding plumage probably starting in March through April. They'll molt back into the breeding plumage. So when they return to our breeding lakes, they're in full breeding plumage. So my approach as a scientist is I've, I've been trained very clinically in a way, very anaclinically. It's just like looking at a car engine. It's very reductionistic. This part of the car does this. This is the alternator. This is the battery voltage regulator. So as a scientist, for better or for worse, right, I tend to be a bit reductionist. That's not, not a bad word, but it's just kind of we try to tease it out as we kind of approach it and study it. So let's kind of look at how I approach loons. So selection is such a big part of what makes loons successful. So if a loon's going to be successful, any trait that's going to help it survive will be selected for in the natural world. So foraging efficiency. So if loons are competing with other loons, those that can forage more efficiently, those traits would be selected for over time. And also animals, it's how well they reproduce. So if I can reproduce better than you, my genes might get passed down to the next generation. So selections and where to build my nest probably becomes an important part. So over time, loons that learn how to 
put their nests in certain locations are going to be more likely to succeed than those that might make a poor choice, for example. And so what we're looking at, like adaptive traits over time, in terms of anatomy, Loon's anatomy has changed over time. Its physiology has changed. And then Loon behavior has changed. And all of that is literally linked to the DNA. And so selection can operate on that. And so loons then can kind of have some wiggle room in terms of their modifications over time. So this is like a bell-shaped curve for any trait. Oftentimes we use human height, human weight, whatever that might be. And it's usually in the standard size. Most of us are in the middle. Like me, I'm very average, right? My parents, my daughters tell me that. Dad, you're very average. Thanks so much, kids. I love you. So selection might move a trait to be smaller, for example, or it might move it in that direction. So if you're following me, that's kind of what we're looking at. So the classic example of selection working would be there's a population of mice that move into an area where there's dark soil or dark rocks. And there's different forms of mice. There's light and dark different shades. And mice are fed on, of course, by hawks, so visual predators. So those that stand out are more likely to be selected against, right, so against this this background here in the middle that we're looking at, the light-colored mice would be selected again. So over time, we see a shift in the population, for example, having dark-colored mice. So how much time for selection to operate? In this case, I'm really looking at loons. We know loons from the anatomical record go back at least a million years, almost literally unchanged. So a million years, paleontology tells us that loon skeletons are still look like loon skeletons a million years back. So if we ask how many generations, that is between uh, being born and in the age at which you reproduce yourself, which is about 10 years in loons, that's 100,000 generations for loons to make subtle modifications and whether it was to use improvements, just adapting to local conditions. So if the environmental conditions have changed, loons have changed with it. So this is some anatomical traits uh, on loons. For example, they have extensions of the ribs that keep their ribs solid, and so lots of compression when they're flying. And so these little processes are really fascinating to look at. Any trait that's going to help a loon dive and stay underwater longer will be selected for, for example. So the ability to utilize oxygen at low levels would be selected for. And then traits that are behavioral traits that help an animal survive, maintain a territory, that might be selected for. So these are all these traits that we look at. And another one is the annual cycle of a loon. So we all know loons tend to get back at certain times of the year. All that has been selected for. So you, most of the time it's like hormonally driven in terms loons get back at usually around first week in May, second week in May, for example. So the annual cycle is under selection. When loons leave, that's under selection. So if they leave too late, ice might come in and they might freeze. So that's under selection. And then in the winter time, how long do I stay in those winter environments? So everything about a loon literally is under selection. And those that make better choices, those traits get selected, become part of the DNA of the loons that we see today. So taking that approach, let's compare loons from this population in the continent that are long distance migrants. So loons that I'm very familiar with, that's where I started my work, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Those loons migrate all the way to the Gulf Coast. So that's 15 to 1,800 miles. Versus short distance migrants would be loons that are in New England, upper New England, so Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Those loons are only flying 100 to 200 miles to get to the ocean. So has selection operated on long distance and short distance migrants, and if so, how? So let's take a look at that. So if you're looking at an animal to transport an animal, it's going to take a long, arduous journey like a migration. Really, my hypothesis that Wisconsin and Minnesota loons might be smaller than New Hampshire and Maine loons because it takes a lot to carry a big body further than a smaller body. And I don't know if anybody follows the Tour de France, the famous bike race, but the famous climbers are sticks, right? They're 120 pounds, like, because going riding a bike up a hill, the lighter you are, the better you are. You let less energy it takes, so you're more efficient. So the selection act on body size in loons. So, well, you got to stay, stay tuned. Don't go. I'm going over it right here. So if we look at this, look at the cost of transport. So if you're looking at fuel efficiency in a vehicle, if you're looking something to get more bang for your buck, you're looking for something that's probably aerodynamic and just lighter in cost. So as an engineer, you're going to look at shape. You're going to see something that's aerodynamic that we might see that in this car here. And we're going to look at weight. And if you compare just looking at the weight and the engineering of these two vehicles, 
One is much more efficient than the other vehicle. Now I use the word structure function. If you're trying to get it off, off on an old road, logging road, that's very bumpy, you might prefer the vehicle on the right. So again, we're just looking at structure and function, you know, no judgments at all. So if we now look at the weights of loons that have been captured, over 100 loons have been captured in each of these cells, and you look at them, these are in grams. To give us an idea, 4,540 grams is about 10 pounds. So New Hampshire female loons are roughly just over 10 pounds, and loons in Wisconsin males are just over 10 pounds. And New York is somewhere in between these two, by the way, New York loons. So we do see females and males are 30 to 35 percent smaller in the Midwest, long distance migrants, than those that are in upper New England, supporting that notion that lighter is probably better for a long distance migrant to be. So again, less weight makes for more efficient flight and it saves energy. So that's my explanation on why loons are smaller in Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin. It's because they're long distance migrants and selection has favored them to be lighter because cost of transport is less. So let's kind of keep going with this scenario. So this is looking at loons from Minnesota, which are much smaller than loons here in New York, for example. But really we're curious, why are loons getting larger, right? So if you look at the selection, loons in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine are getting larger. Why is it advantageous to be smaller, for example? So let's kind of look at that. So some of you maybe have seen this as well. So this is a picture of loons. And what's going on here? This is not a social gathering. This is a very like aggressive encounter. So what we see is that loons compete for territories. When there's a shortage of lakes or a shortage of territories, Loons actually battle and compete for territories. And usually what we find in the animal kingdom, the larger size typically tends to win the battle. So if you look at a variety of animals, elephant seals, bighorn sheep, elk, Herculean beetles, usually the larger one wins the battle. So that tells me selection is probably favoring larger loons in upper New England because they're able to retain a territory. And because they're not migrating far, cost of transport doesn't play a big role in selecting on body size in loons. So an extension of what we've just learned, if you look at the wings, for example, on a loon, you can see they're very narrow. And overall, they're 20% shorter for a bird of its predicted body size. So this is going to cause less surface area. So why, why do we see that in common loons? Well, da Vinci recognized this way back in 1519, trying to develop machines that could fly. He recognized you need a large surface area, right? In order to get off the ground to get lift, you need a large surface area, and most of us recognize you know, that's the case. So in order to get off the ground, you need surface area to, and to stay off the ground. And the Wright brothers knew this. It was all about using lightweight materials in order to fly and then have as much surface area as possible. And then you need someone crazy enough to actually sit up there and fly the machine. But it worked really well, and there's some great books on, on the Wright brothers. So now if you're a loon, what have we just done? Loons are not optimally designed for flight, right? They don't have a lot of surface area in that wing as we've just seen. So how come loons don't have large surface area? Well, that's because the loon spends 99% of its time in the water, right? They should be hydrodynamically designed, not aerodynamically designed. And that's really the thinking about it. So, and if a loon is in danger, right, it dives. If a mallard's in danger, it flies away, right? Most birds will attempt to fly. Diving birds, right, that's how they get away. That's their safety zone. The wings are narrow, so they fit next to the body to reduce water resistance. So in other words, by having my narrow body and my wings the same size as my body, nothing sticks out. If something stuck out, that would create an eddy or a whirl. Anybody who's ever rafted in a river, you know, rocks create eddies, and that's kind of what would happen here. So just looking at this, I'm showing you a picture of a diagram. Here's the wing. It's really held, compressed, and folded next to the body. So loons are foot propelled, unlike penguins, which use their wings. So that is to minimize drag. So that's going to help loons to be hydrodynamically designed, hence the narrow wings. Now there's another feature, if you're looking at this loon here, notice how streamlined the belly is, right? And so what we're looking at is a comparison. This is very narrow. So this is the keel. And if we compare the keel of a hydrodynamic bird like a loon versus an aerodynamic design 
we'll see something different. So this is the breastplate, the sternum of a loon, and this is where muscles attach. And you can see that's very narrow. In contrast to a pigeon, which is aerodynamically designed, look at that keel. So that's where big chest muscles attach. So in order to get lift, you have big, powerful muscles to push against the air to get you off the ground. So the trade-off is because there's minimal room for chest muscles and attachment, what do loons have except this minimized muscle in order to get lift? Because it's better for them to be streamlined, right? And hence the small keel, and there's just not room for big muscles. So they have small chest muscles compared to a bird that's aerodynamically designed. Consequently, that trade-off, we all know loons need a long runway, you know, three to four soccer fields just to get them off the air. And they oftentimes will orient themselves in position of the wind in order to get left. So this is classic picture, right? We've all seen this. And so it seems forever sometimes for them in order to get left to get off the ground. I believe it. I believe it. Oh, yes, it was. Yeah. And now we're going to get to that. Good observation. So when we're looking at this, because selection has favored a hydrodynamic design for loons, which makes sense, they're diving birds, in order for them to maintain their flight, right, they have to beat their wings 240 times per minute. And that gets them 70, reaching speeds of 70 miles per hour. Because how often do you ever see a loon, I'm just going to glide, right? If they tried to glide, we all know what's going to happen. They're going to fall down because they just don't have the surface area. So that's the story behind it. So consequently, in order to move, they just fly like, like trains, very fast. OK, you made, it, you made it through part one. So part two is looking at the latest and greatest findings. And I'm going to give you a baker's dozen. So I can, I can probably put 30 or 40 or 50, but let's look at 13. And really, the breakthrough came. So Judy McIntyre, who was, was, did a lot of work in, in New York as well, was doing some of the early work in the 70s and 80s, trying to figure out, can we catch a loon and put a band on it? So you were asking about banded loons. And why would you want a band loon? It seems somewhat invasive. It is to some degree. But all of, us have, all of us have probably looked at birds, and you see two chickadees at your feeder. Well, which one's the male? Which one's the female? Is that the same pair? We see right two blue jays. Eh, I don't know. Wouldn't it be nice to know who's the male, who's the female? Do they come back year after year to the same area? And that's ultimately as the scientists were trying to gather information about these birds, the demography of these birds. How long do loons live? Well, if we don't ban the bird, we're not really going to know that information. So that's, that's where banding became real paramount. And Dave Evers, to talk about serendipity, was a college classmate in 1980 of me. So going back, to, and if I don't meet Dave, I don't do loon work. So you look, depending on how you look at view, cosmology, and all that stuff. So this is in 1988, 89, 90, I was helping Dave help catch loons to band loons for his master's degree at Western Michigan University. So we figured this out. So then I felt like I could carry this on for my doctorate work, which I did. And then that became kind of my lifelong work. So essentially what you do when you go out at night, you have that bright light that you saw. That disorients the loons. And it works best when loons have chicks. So when they have chicks, parental instinct to protect them is so strong that they overcome their fear of the bright light. And they stay on the surface of the water. They don't dive. So then you can just come in with a big net, scoop them up. Then that's an interesting thing. You got a big bird in your hand, right? <laughs> and then, it, oh, then we get then we get to tricks later. Scoop them up. Well, usually though, if another parent's there, they'll go to the other parent. And then we can ban this bird. So once you have it in the hand, as a scientist, you want to gather as much data as possible. So we want to weigh the birds. Hence, why we were able to get all those weights from the birds in Minnesota, Wisconsin, for example. You take bill measurements of the birds. This is wing measurements. And you just gather as much data as you can before you release the bird back in the wild. And really, the major breakthrough came with studying loons was literally, like I say, late 1980s, 1990s, when Dave perfected the technique. And the bottom line is, when the chicks are really young, if you play a particular call, just like a whale call or a chick distress call, the loon comes towards the boat. So our success rate's about 95%. So it's really simple. It's, it's, a loon, it's not that hard. It's still a lot of work to get to that point, but then you got them. So then notice the way that the shape of the leg on a loon is very narrow, compressed. It's like a canoe paddle. So very broad this way, and then when they receive them, they bend their feet to minimize resistance in the water. 
So very narrow, but very odd. But once you can ban birds, and one of them that you see here would be a federal band, so that we, we report that to the federal, federal banding lab. And then if that bird ends up anywhere, that comes back to us as banders. And so we know that bird's in South Carolina or that bird was in Florida, for example. But then the color bands help us to identify them as individuals. And that really was the major breakthrough. So starting around 1993 at full time, we were banding loons across North America and gathering some really fascinating data. So since that time, over 9,000 loons are banded in, in the United States. So 9,000, which is a ridiculous amount of effort over, spanning over 30 years. These are some of the organizations, BRI, the Anironic Center for Conservation, Wisconsin DNR, are just mo are most of the individuals that really have done all this work. And then this is what the bands look like. So look at all these different, this is me down in Louisiana trying to figure out what kind of bands to put on birds because we can't duplicate banding combinations. Well, there's only so many red, yellow, yellow, red, red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, green, right? There's only so many permutations you could have. So then we started putting dots on them. We started putting stripes on them just to make the pants so we have more combinations to accommodate more and more birds. So that's where you, if you put a color combination on, and then we reobserve the birds. So then we can then ask ourselves all kinds of questions. You know, do loons pair for life? Do they switch territories? Do they come back to the areas where they were born? How long do they live? Are parental roles shared equally? Are just some of the questions. So here's the baker's dozen. So over that, because of all these banding efforts, we do know that return territorial rate there is 80%. So in other words, the birds that are in Tupper Lake, let's say in the southeast section, 80% chance those are the same birds year after year. And the annual survival rate of loons is 92%. So loons as adults, there's low mortality. Like if you get it to year six or seven, you're gonna live a long life for the most part. Now, loons do not mate for life. Uh, that was something that was thought for a long time. Oftentimes they'll have two or more partners during their lifetime, and that's just kind of the way it is. The average duration pair bond is, seems to be about six to seven years. So then after about six to seven years, something happens and they, they get a new mate. And the longest pair bond, though, has been 25 years, which is pretty remarkable. And there's the, before that, the record was 17 years. So we do know they can form very, very long-term partnerships as well. So the average male starts breeding at year, we can see here, five or six, and females at year six or seven. So once they hatch from New York, for example, they make it to the ocean, they stay there, they might stay another year on the ocean, and then little by little they start coming back to freshwater lakes, but it takes them multiple years in order to gain access to a territory, is what the data has showed us. So it's not like you come back and you start breeding at year three, you're breeding at about year six or year seven. So the oldest birds, I was there for banding both of these birds. I was with Dave. We were just talking about this the other day. It was uh, great to kind of catch up with Dave. So we banded an adult female in 1992. That bird is still living. And we banded a chick in 1989, and that bird is still living. So those are two birds that are at least 35 years old because we know that this female, when we banded it, was probably five years old, which would have been born in 1987. So you can get, kind of do the math from that. Not all loans make it to 30 years. So looking at some of the banded birds' recoveries, some of them are missing and probably did not make it to 30 years. But you know, several of them did. Chicks tend to return to the natal area. So if all things, chicks are going to come back. This is the area I'm familiar with. This is where my parents are. And usually parents are like, eh, push them over to the next territory. And eventually they figure out their spot and their location in which to breed. Females disperse a little further than males. So male loons know their neighbor's yodel. So let me see if this actually works. We didn't test this, Leanne, to see if it worked. And I'm not sure if it's going to work. Uh, it's playing. Yeah, I'm not hearing it. I have a plan B. Here's my plan B, my own yodel call. So this call is only given by the males, and maybe some of you recognize it. It's called a yodel, right? So that's the yodel. And only males give this call. And it's usually in this crouch position, early morning or at night you hear it, telling all the other loons, I'm here, this is my territory, I'm willing to defend it. They're the, well, I think they're detaining their space, their territory. Like this, is, this, this area of the lake belongs to me and my partner is what they're communicating. 
So let's kind of go back to here and see. So the neighbor yodel. So this is a sonogram, right, of a yodel of a loon. And uh, if we look at it, what I want to point out to you is there's like an introductory phase, and then these repeat motifs. So the introductory phase, what's, what's the role of that in communication? So to give you an example, you know, I've had children. Fortunately, they're, all, they're adults now. It's all good. But when you had young children, and let's say they were close to the stairs and they might fall, you, you initially get, a, get their attention. You say, hey, hey, right? And you kind of get their attention. That's the introductory note because, hey, you're going to fall off the stairs. Be careful. OK, I got it. So what loons do and what most birds do is they give an introductory note. So song sparrows, other birds, they get dee dee, they get your attention, and then here's the message. So the introductory phrase is telling all the loons, I'm about to say something. OK, what is it about you're going to say? Well, I'm going to say this. So listen to this again. Listen for the introductory note. It comes really fast. And then we hear that. And so that was a, that was a two note one. So and the reason we, I have this here for us to look at is so now what scientists have done because let's say all the loons on a lake, they all know each other. So now let's say Jimmy, since I'm a Jim, let's Jim loon over here. We're going to scoop you up out of the net. We're going to move you, and we're going to play a recorder of another loon. So we play that recording of the loon. What does this loon, neighbor one, what does that loon do? It's like, well, all of a sudden, that's a new loon in the area. And look what happens to it. So when it hears a stranger, this is what it changes its tune from that to this. And so our interpretation of that is this loon is highly agitated, not really happy because there's a new loon in the area. I know that. And this experiment's been done multiple times. It's revved up, and it's communicating, I, I, this is my part of the lake. This is my territory, and I'm willing to defend it. So some other latest and greatest findings. So a researcher in Wisconsin was able, in Minnesota, caught some loons. They put these depth pressure sensors on their feet. So when they went to migrate, they were recording the depth at which these birds were diving. They're looking at foot per square inch, pounds per square inch, right, underwater. And then you need to catch that, download the, download the data, and look at it. So these are birds that migrated to Lake Michigan. And now this is the depth profile from one bird on the 4th of November, 2009. This is starting at 9 in the morning to like 4 o'clock PM. This is their birds in Lake Michigan. This is the surface, and this is if a bird dives. And notice what the bird does. These loons literally dove to the bottom of Lake Michigan. This is in meter, so this is probably 135, 140 feet. This loon dove all the way to the bottom, 140 feet, came back up, rested for just eh, a few seconds, came back again, down, went again. And look, look how many times successive dives it made with really short intervals. Then, OK, here's a little break. Thank you, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then we made a whole bunch of series of dives. Little break here about 1 o'clock. But look at how many dives this bird made. So here's the point. If this was really exhausting for Loon to dive to 145 feet, they would have longer breaks, right? So it's like me running a marathon. Right? After 5 miles, 10 miles, I need a break versus go run another 5 miles. So it says it doesn't, this, this ability doesn't really tax the aerobic capacity. Like, this is pretty easy for a loon to do. That's my interpretation of this. So if we look at depth of dive and duration in loons, we can compare them to other great divers, which are penguins. So penguins come in different sizes, little, medium, and small. These are grams. And recall, loons are medium size, 4,500 grams, 5,500 grams, for example. So loons fit in this category. And if we look at the depth, of these loons, small loons, small penguins are about 100 feet. Medium sized dive to 300 to 600 feet, and large penguins are 800 feet. And the reason we're looking at penguins, since penguins are, it's much easier to gather this data from penguins than from loons. That, that's why we're using this comparison. But very similar birds. And if you look at duration, loons can probably dive three to six minutes. And I've seen loons dive four to five minutes. So that's a very oft asked question how deep can loons get? I'm pretty comfortable thinking loons can get to 300 feet and stay in the water for as long as four or five minutes. Most of their dives, they don't need to. That Lake Michigan, that was about three-minute dives. So most of the time, it's like three minutes. And then when on the freshwater lakes here, they don't need to dive that deep. They're working on kind of the shallow water, so they might dive 40 or 30, 30 to 40 seconds, for example. Are they gathering 
Yes, and so this is a great thing. So what we're seeing, for example, those that were diving to the bottom of Lake Michigan, they were feeding on benthic fish. And the only reason they're doing that and is this is there's a species of fish called gobies that hang out in the bottom of Lake Michigan, and that's what they were feeding on. So they are being opportunistic in acting more like specialists than generalists. So if you're a loon and you're diving and you see a fish, you might, like me, ADD, start chasing that fish, start chasing that fish like Nemo, like all over the place. Well, this is saying these loons, nope, I'm going straight down to the bottom, going to get rewarded, straight down to the bottom. And so they know where the food source is in that case. That is a lot of fish to eat. I don't know if it's successful all the time, right? Okay, so we went through that. That was a great question. So then here's the dark side of the loon. So this is, my, this is uh, Dr. Mark Pokris, who's the necropsies of loons. And this is kind of the dark side, like, of loons. So, <laughs> so what do we know about loons, the dark side? So Mark started doing necropsy. So any loon that dies makes its way to Mark's office. He's a professor at Tufts University in Boston. He examines it and determines cause of death, CS, CSI, right? So he looks at that, and what he found is that this is the breastplate of a loon, the sternum, and there's these puncture wounds. So he asked himself, what makes those puncture wounds? So then he took the bill of a loon, and he placed it in the sternum, and it's like, oh my gosh, it fits. These are actually loons puncturing the sternum of other loons. So essentially it would be, here's a loon on the surface, this loon comes underneath, periscope straight up, and tries to stab it, kill it, and drive it away, right? So that's what we're seeing. And the fascinating thing that Mark found, half the loons that he necropsied had sternal punctures. So which tells us it's not a rare event, it's fairly common for it to happen. And the other thing that was utterly fascinating is what he found, the sternal punctures were just as common in females as they were in males. So we suspect it's probably female, female, male, male, but we're not exactly sure, but probably male, male competition and female, female competition, but really fascinating to think about that as well. This is just kind of what could be a story. This is me in Hollywood, Morro Bay. I banded this bird in 2004. It was reobserved for 17 consecutive winters with the same bands, showing that loons exhibit winter site fidelity. So there's about 85% winter site fidelity. So I did this in California, off the west coast in Washington, New England, Louisiana, and what we found is that loons went back to the same site year after year. Okay, this is my last baker's dozen. So this will just hang in there with me. So if we're interpreting this, these are like all loon pairs. This is parental effort. I would define parental effort as how long you sit in the nest, how often you feed, I watched birds, loons, from 4.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. Every time a loon did anything, I was recording, and he did this for one week and one month and one season and two seasons, and he got the juice. So I'm looking to see who's sharing effort 50-50. So if it's a perfect relationship, when we all know some of us are married and have kids, is it really 50-50? Eh, maybe not. You know, so if it was 50-50, we would see a perfectly straight line across all loon pairs. What do you think that it's going to look like? Well, what we're going to find is that this is 5%, 10%. So females, and like half of these loons, put more effort into caring for the chicks than males did. But in some pairs, males put more effort into protecting and providing for the chicks than females did. So what you find there is just probably a dynamic partnership that all loon pairs settle in on and ultimately have to cooperate to some degree if they're going to be successful raising chicks. Stories from the field, three stories, and I limited, limited myself to three stories. And then we'll open it up for questions. So here's story number one, Gulf of Mexico, January 2012. Here's some loons in the bottom. This is off the coast of Louisiana. These are cormorants up here. And I was doing this work in January, February, and March. So I live in Maine. Well, I do live in Maine when I did that work. I've lived in a lot of different places. So down there, there's brown pelicans and skimmers and roseate spoonbills. This is us working in the Gulf of Mexico with radio telemetry we put on loons and we're tracking them. Meanwhile, my wife's shoveling three feet of snow in Maine and I had to tell my wife, God, it's hard work, dear, look at this, it's hard. I didn't get much sympathy. I, we ended up getting a snowblower, but uh, <laughs> so, so there, there it is, right? But when I was down there studying loons, I was blown away, look at this, bottlenose dolphins. I saw dolphins every day and I saw dolphins and loons every day. Like, are you kidding? What a, and, and there's this phenomenal interaction that I had. And 
I, I, I don't know if I, I, I'll save you. I, I could read from the book here, but essentially here's, here's what happened. Because we're out there watching these dolphins, and the dolphins are moving towards an island, and they're just fluking. So they're going up and down, and it's like they're schooling fish. Like let's say there's a species of fish down there called menhaden, really small and thin. And the fish are jumping away from the dolphin, and, or dolphins as they're moving. So when the water gets shallower, I think the dolphin's going to get more likely to catch these fish. And then the fish are jumping off to the side. So now I'm watching this loon. And what's the loon doing? Well, the loon's following in the wake of the dolphin. So when the fish are evading the dolphins, the loons, my gosh, are, are eating the fish. Like, really? Really? Like, really? Like, that's happening? Am I seeing this? It, it was just incredible. So that's one of my stories that I love to tell, and I write about that in the book. And each chapter of the book starts off with a story, because I'm a storyteller. So I've got to grab your attention. So that's, that's, that's one of the stories. OK, here's another story. So as a scientist, I write grants. Maybe they get funded or not, I write proposals. And it's kind of ongoing. And it's rare to get two grants funded at the same time. That happened to me. Like, oh my gosh, i got to be two places at once. We haven't, can't clone myself. So it's one of the study areas was up in Alaska. So this is, a, or this is Russia, excuse me. This was a grant given by an organization called Trust for Mutual Understanding. And the grant was to train other Russian scientists how to catch loons. How awesome. Really, with this foundation, very noble. And so we had cross-pollination of ideas and thoughts. So I got a chance to go to Russia, or I got a chance to go to east of Beryl on the North Slope in Alaska and study loons up there. Holy cow, how do you make that decision? And this project, again, was looking at yellow-billed loons, Pacific loons, and Arctic loons. So just a great opportunity. Either way, it was a win-win. I started researching the Russia project and just realized, logistically, it's really challenging. The helicopter, the airplane service is not very reliable. You can get stranded for weeks or a month in the middle of the Arctic. And I got family. I want to get back to my wife. I'm going to choose Alaska. So I had to find somebody, and then there's, I knew people who could work. So I had somebody go then to Russia. So this is Lucas, who goes to Russia, fills in. And this is Diana Solyeva, the Russian scientist that we worked with. So just a great, great project. It worked really well. So here you can see the bands on the birds. And Lucas is an extraordinarily competent biologist, uh, just a great guy. So really, really cool. So now, what did you notice? So I'm kind of giving you back. So if you look at <laughs> What do you notice about this photograph? Oh, well, like, how, like, oh, like, what is that? That's a femur of what? So while he is up there, there's a paleontologist doing a dig of a woolly mammoth. Like, are you kidding? Like, I could, that could have been me? Oh, my gosh. And then next to a woolly mammoth, the femur of the woolly mammoth, and they dated it to 12,385 years ago. So Lucas told some great stories, and I was a little reluctant, like I didn't go to Russia. Ah! <laughs> and I don't think there's going to be a next time now. I think things change, but wow, really cool. So this is me in Barrel, Alaska. This is a little chopper. This is our station. So we actually, like snowmobiles, dropped this off. And then now snow's melting, and then we go to our station. This is far away. These are the tents that we set up. This is a little electric fence perimeter to keep grizzly bears out. I don't think it would keep a grizzly bear out if it wanted. But, OK, I have to get trained in using arms and things like that, just in case, because there are grizzlies up there. So you kind of go through that. But we slept up here. Now, the one thing, being north of the Arctic Circle, the sun never set. How do you sleep? Like, you don't. You just go on. It's pretty awesome. It's like a drug. <laughs> Woo, you're wired, like for days, weeks. Like, I'm good, I'm good. And then at some point, you crash. But it's just amazing. Uh, this is mosquitoes <laughs> on the lens. I had to say something about that. But my gosh, I got to see caribou. Are you like kidding? We're a loon biologist. Dolphins, caribou, coming close, like just, just amazing. It felt very Arctic fox transitioning. And I've got another 150 pictures for those of you. I have a showing at 7 o'clock. We'll look at more. Uh, you know, OK, maybe not. But here's the uh, yellow-billed loons that we saw. This is us capturing them. And now the cool thing, this is just, just how, how cool to be able to hold this bird. And yellow-billed loons are massive. They are really big. Uh, this is me happy and frozen at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And story number three, last one. So this is Nevada. I think some of you are questioning, OK, research in Nevada, what's, what's going on there? So this is Walker Lake, April 1998. It's 11 miles 
by five miles. It's on the eastern side of the Sierra. So if you look at Nevada, here's the Sierra Nevada mountains here. So this catches all the rain. So this is on the rain shadow effect. So it's very dry. All precipitation has gone as it's tried to go over the mountains. So it's a desert environment. Here's Walker Lake. This is Carson City, Reno, and Vegas is down here. So we were called in because over a thousand loons during spring and fall stage at Walker Lake. So during migration up into either Canada or Montana and then back south, where they winter off the southern coast of California, for example, they're feeding on these native fish, tui chub and lahat and cutthroat trout. So we were called in there to help catch loons. And the biologist from the state of Nevada who saw this and recognized this was just trying to raise people's attention. So if we can get people to come there and catch loons and find out maybe where they went, it could be pretty exciting. So here's, now I will read for you from a little short excerpt here. The wildlife research involves roving parts, and sometimes things do not always go according to plan. Here's a good example. In 1998, Dave Evers and I were at Walker Lake, Nevada, teaming up with researchers Mike Yates and Mark Fuller from Boise State University, Larry Neal from the Nevada Department of Wildlife, and Kevin Keenow from the U.S. Geological Survey. Each team was there to do a specific job. Mike and Mark from Boise were the leaders of the project. The team from Nevada had the boats, the drivers, and the expertise to navigate around the lake. And the USG staff were responsible for conducting surgeries and implanting the satellite transmitters. And Dave and I were there to catch loons. We met the third week of April. So that's kind of our role, delineations. And when you have a project like this, there's a budget, there's a limited amount of budget, you got different players coming. You get, at some point, you gotta say third week of April, right? You just, this is it, fourth week, third week. And then irrespective of weather, this is when we're going. Like, here we are, third week of April, we show up and now we gotta do our work. And so we went through our introductions and all of a sudden we find out, for example, that the satellite transmitters, let's see if I've got this right, so the book is, the satellite transmitters were not in hand. So as much as you try to time all this, and they were going to be there the next day. So what do we do? Well, the first night, Dave and I, this is 1998. This is still pretty new for us. We weren't sure we could catch loons during migration because they didn't have the chicks with them. So what's to prevent a loon from just diving when you shine a light on it? Nothing. So we weren't sure we could even catch loons. And so we're like, let's just go out tonight and see if we can work. The other thing with that is even the weather forecast was like really high winds. So this desert valley just on the eastern side of the mountains, the winds just howl. And they were forecasting 30 to 40 mile per hour winds, big waves, and we might not be able to go out. So let's go out and try to catch loons. So we go out, the hard work continued all night. We did locate several loons. A few paused upon seeing the light, and this gave us a chance to net them. We caught five loons that night, but we were faced with the hard reality that the satellite transmitters would not arrive until the next day, and we had no place to keep the loons overnight. So did we release them and try our luck tomorrow? What if the weather conditions worsened as expected and we could not launch the boats? Loons are big, hardy birds, and with our collective experience, we felt the loons would be fine if we kept them overnight. But where? With limited options, we reasoned we had to take them with us to our hotel rooms. <laughs> Was this going to work? Seriously, did we tell the hotel manager we would each have an additional guest in our rooms? <laughs> so. So pr probably not. And, uh, but at the end of the day, and so we, one of us stayed up all night with the loons. We had each loon in the bathroom, and then we tried it in the bathtub, and it's a long story. All came out well. So we put in the satellite transmitters the next day, and yes, this loon is anesthetized, and it comes out of anesthesia just like you and I have ever been under. You wake up and you're like, ah. And then after a while, you wake up and you're, you're fine. So we released them. There's the satellite transmitter. This is very layable, right? It's very flexible, it bends. And of course, it's connecting to the satellites orbiting the Earth, and we can plot where these birds are found. So these birds went to northwest Saskatchewan relatively soon. So within two, three weeks, they were already here, which, which is a really good sign for us. So the end of the story, well, not quite. 13 years later, here I am catching loons off the coast of Louisiana. I've got a team of researchers I'm working with. And we put out two satellite transmitters and loons just off the coast of Louisiana. So we catch two birds in random in Louisiana, put satellite transmitters in them, and here's one of them. So this is Louisiana. This is right New Orleans, literally right there. So it spent 10 days in Tennessee, departed at day 23. 
goes up to Lake Michigan, stays there for 15 days. So you can see they migrate a long distance, then they stage, fatten up for a week or two. Went to Lake Winnipeg for six days. 52 days later, 2,309 miles, this bird went to Saskatchewan. Wow, that's pretty amazing. We didn't expect that. The other bird we caught spent several days off the Mississippi coast. Then it went to North Carolina Reservoir. Then it went to Chesapeake Bay. Then it went to Lake Erie for 12. And then we can see it went to Lake Huron for 10 days, Lake Winnipeg for two or three. And then 72 days later, so just over two months, 2,776 miles, this bird goes to Saskatchewan. Now, because I was working on a project in 1998, I have memory, not great, but I do have some memory. It's like, eh, remember those birds in Walker Lake? They went to Saskatchewan, and these birds, they, they, they went to Saskatchewan. I should plot the data and see what it looks like. So this is the data from the birds that we caught. This is down in Baja Peninsula, but these birds went to Saskatchewan. And we zoom in here in northwest Saskatchewan. These are our Louisiana birds. My gosh, it looks like they overlap. So zoom in a little closer. So my expression, I apologize. My expression is holy fudge cookies. That's, like, that's, my, that's my word, right? Holy fudge cookies. Holy fudge cookies. Are you kidding me? Like Peter Pond Lake in the middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan. Doesn't that look like this is the thin birds that we see here? This is the birds that came from Walker Lake. This is the bird that came from Louisiana. We zoom in. They were used the same lake in the same corner of the lake. Do you realize the probability of that happening? <laughs> you have a better chance of winning the lottery. Two birds random in Great Walker Lake, Nevada, and a random bird in the middle of the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico, and are you telling me they go to the same lake and the same corner of the lake? I mean, I should have bet the lottery after that. So I really thought long and hard about how to capture my emotions, or what's the word that best sums up what just happened, and this is what I get. <laughs> Hopefully you can relate to that. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it, right? All right, so we're, so we're winding down. End of the day, I've had 248 volunteers worked with me for at least a week in the field. Amazing people. Earthwatch Institute, a group in Boston, has funded my research for over a dozen years. Very grateful for them. I've worked with 52 biologists for at least a week. So this isn't like a biologist shows up for a day. This is like biologists I got to know. Wonderful, wonderful people. And these seven in particular, I've worked with for at least four or five years, some of them 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And if, like for Hope, and you, some young biologists I've worked with, they're just full of passion and goodness that I see a very bright future for, for this, for researchers. And these are all some of the, loon, many of the loon researchers who've contributed greatly to some of the information I've presented. And of course, having a very supportive family certainly helps, never hurts, you know, being gone for a long time. And, and then as I, when, I, when I got back from the airport, I always demanded my children be there. It was, I'm a tough, tough dad. I want you to be there. I've been gone for so long, so the kids would be there. And the kids got older, they're like, Dad, nah, we're not going to meet you at the airport. <laughs> I know, right? I know, I hurt, man, killing me, girls. All right, and I just want to mention the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. You have a local group that works here in Saranac Lake. Uh, that just is, is monitoring the loons in New York and just doing an awesome, awesome job. Yeah, I'm sure they'd use your support any way you can. And they just do a great job educating people about Adirondack loons and conservation threats and things like that. So their office is in Saranac Lake. And Nina Shocks, the executive director, a friend of mine, just does great work. Photo credits would be these dear people that I worked with. I have a website. If you ever want to just go to sleep, watch the website. It puts you right to sleep. But it has events and things, the research that I've been doing and then turning in for inspiration. And I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you. How fast do you lose 